It is my pleasure to join uh, David Cash, who's here on behalf of DSAG, and Dean Gallagher in welcoming you to the conference, and especially to this opening session. In this special opening entitled Women in Leadership, A View from the Top, you're going to hear the authentic voices of three accomplished women who are role models in their fields. You're gonna find out the choices they made in order to move to the top, and you're going to discover that leadership is their passion and that courage defines them. So you have already met, but I'll mention again, on the stage you have Ravita Franklin Bowers, USC class of 70, fight on, um, <laughs> who is retiring after 44 years as head of school at the Center for Early Education in Los Angeles. However, she will continue as a leader in her field and remain a distinguished member of several high-powered boards. You have our Dean, Karen Gallagher, the Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops, Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education and our courageous leader who has moved our school to be one of the premier schools of education in the nation. A true pioneer in the practitioner-focused education doctorate and an innovator in online education at the national and global levels. And joining Ravita and the Dean is Michelle King, superintendent of the second largest school district in the nation, LA Unified. In addition to being superintendent, Michelle is a current doctoral student at USC Rossier. She is someone who leads and inspires and is a woman at the top who needs to be watched. Fight on, Michelle. <laughs> you have bios of our honored panelists in your programs, and rather than reading them to you, our panelists will share their personal stories. Did they start with the end in mind, or did the journey present forks in the road? How did they decide which way to go? You will have the opportunity to listen and learn, to be inspired and challenged, to think about what leadership means to these three accomplished women, and to reflect on your own professional goals and apply what you hear and learn. So imagine a fireside chat or fishbowl, if you like, as our panelists share their perspectives with each of you and with the audience. Our panelists will respond to several topics that I've prepared for them, and at about 4 p.m., we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So there's a mic on each side of the room, and I'll give you a prompt uh, when it's time uh, to come up and ask your questions, so be thinking about those. And then at 425, we'll have one final question to challenge the panelists um, to share their thoughts with you. So to begin with, our panelists, each one will take five minutes to um, talk about their personal journey through their experiential lens. We're going to be starting um, with Ravita. So, Ravita, could you tell us uh, about the road you traveled? Was it smooth or was it rocky? There were speed bumps. <laughs> um, the first was deciding to even be an educator. I'm the fourth generation teacher in my family. And one of the things that I had made up my mind as I was graduating from SC was that the last thing I wanted to be was a teacher. And so I went into merchandising. I was the assistant fashion director at Bullock's Wilshire for about a year. And then my husband was in law school. And I needed to have more regular hours and decided that I would go and apply to work for LA Unified. And I did. I went to the Downey office, was called in for an interview, and was interviewed by my former second grade teacher. <laughs> because I had gone all the way through LA Unified from kindergarten through 12th grade. And he sent me to team teach with my former kindergarten teacher at 92nd Street School, which was where he had taught. Um, I worked for LA Unified for about a year and a half, and then I was furloughed because the enrollment dropped. And I had had an associate superintendent who had visited in my classroom often. And she gave me a card and she said, if they haven't rehired you by August, here's a card of an independent school. 
And you may be able to get on the sub list in August until they call the teachers back and the enrollment picks up. So by mid-August, I knew I had bills to pay and we hadn't heard from the district. So I called the Center for Early Education, which was a preschool through sixth grade program in West Hollywood, was asked to come in that same day. And after two hours of interviews, I was hired as a kindergarten teacher. Um, I had never had any experience with independent schools, had assumed that I would follow my mother who taught for LA Unified for 38 years and both of her sisters who taught in LA Unified in LA Unified and then leave teaching and go to law school, which had been my original intent. <coughs> but I stayed in the classroom four years and the then head of school announced four years in and I had two young children by that time, that she wanted to retire. She was gonna go back to school, get her PhD, and become a lay psychoanalyst. And so I was at home in July on family leave. I had a 17-month-old and a three-week-old daughter and was intending to go back in September and resume my duties as a kindergarten teacher. And I got a call from the board president. Now, independent schools are managed by boards, but the head of school is the chief operating officer and the sole employee of the board. And they had been searching for eight months for a head of school. And he called and he said, Ravita, how are you? And I said, I'm great, thank you. I'm, how great can you be with a 17-month-old and a three-week-old? I'm sleep deprived. And he said, I have a proposition for you. And I said, what is it? And I thought he was going to ask me to change grade levels. And he said, I want to offer you the head of school's job. Now, I was 26 years old. I had zero administrative experience, except that I had volunteered to take on a number of tasks during the four years. I had taken over the ordering of all supplies, in large part because the first year the head of school forgot to order them. And then I had taken on writing the master schedule, and then in the third year I had taken on writing the class lists and putting the kids in classes. But that was the extent of my administrative experience. And he said, we've interviewed 40 people, and we haven't found the right person, and we'd love for you to do it. And I said to him, you know, I think I really want to go to law school after another year. And he said to me, how much are you making? And I was making a, a very nice salary for a teacher. And I told him how much I was making, and he said to me, we'll double your salary. I said, I'll take the job. <laughs> and that's how I became an educational administrator. Um, an unlikely path, not without its speed bumps. But I will tell you that over my 40 years of running the school, uh, and it's highly unlikely, even in independent schools, for people to stay in a school for 44 years, the same school. But there was never a day I wasn't eager to go to work. Even when I knew I had something that was gonna be really challenging and difficult to do. Let a teacher go preside over the memorial service of a child. But each day I was eager to do the work and I found that it replenished my soul and even though I had not considered the start of my teaching career a calling in any way, I found my administrative career to be one of great pleasure. So I'm gonna stop and let the rest of the panel tell you how they got to their positions. Thank you. Did you always know you were going to be the superintendent? <laughs> Partly. <laughs> so um, again, I'm, I'm pleased to be here joining you today. And uh, my journey uh, also was um, something that I kind of I, I determined myself as falling into. 
kind of fell into uh, uh, education and it started some 32 years ago. So now um, this September, I will have been um, in LA Unified for 32 years. And so um, sometimes folks think it's unusual for someone to stay in a, with a particular organization or company uh, throughout their career. Uh, but that has been um, my uh, story, uh, a product of LA Unified and have worked in um, LA Unified throughout my career. And, and when I left uh, college, when I was a, a senior, I was tired, as many of you understand what that is when you finally reach that point. And I was actually on my way to medical school. And so my uh, desire was to be a doctor. And I had applied uh, to medical school, and actually I was accepted to medical school. And I said, but I am just, I need to take a break. I really want to get a little rest and then um, go back after a year. So I applied and I was able to get uh, my uh, acceptance deferred for a year. And I happened to be uh, reading in the paper and I saw where LA Unified was advertising for science and math teachers. And so still, even back then, science and math teachers were in a high demand. And I graduated with a biology degree. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll look into this. So I went down and um, I looked into it. Now remember, I'm graduating with a content degree. I did not have a teaching degree. I had no experience in teaching. I wasn't trained in teaching. Um, I was trained uh, um, as a biologist, and that was my background. But I went down, and I said, let me find out. And I figured maybe I could sub. That's what I thought I would be able to do. I get, uh, take the sea best, and I could sub. And I found out at the time that they were launching uh, a new uh, teacher certification program uh, in which uh, they would be able to provide you with a credential. You would go to school and you would work on the job, get experience at the same time. And I thought this would be fantastic because one, I can move out of the house, um, I can get a job and get paid, and then they will train me um, uh, to be a teacher. So I said, fabulous, this shouldn't be a problem at all. So I went down and uh, applied, and I, you, at that time we were at 450 North Grand, and you had principals and sitting in a big room like a cafeteria, and you kind of go from station to station, and you get interviewed. Well, the first station I went to, believe it or not, and they, you know, science major, they scooped me up and uh, said, you're hired, we want you to come uh, to, to work for us, and it was then a junior junior high school, and I was so ecstatic and excited um, to be able to do this. But again, not exactly knowing what I was going to get myself into. And so uh, before school started, I want to say a week before, I had this training program, kind of an uh, immersion program, you might call it, where you just kind of deep dive into everything you wanted to know uh, about teaching so you could get started on that first day. Uh, and all of us, of course, know who are educators that you need a lot more than one week of, of a deep dive to go into a classroom, particularly of junior high school <laughs> students. Right, and so um, I went in and then I thought I was all excited and I, I got my first class and, and I had science and I, I go in and I have this long science uh, table and I'm behind it and I have about 35 junior high school kids staring at me, looking at me, waiting for me to do something and I think, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? And so it was one of those every day, go home, stay up late at night, trying to write it all out, your lesson plans. and. Uh, and not really knowing uh, exactly how to do it, and then going to class that week, and them teaching me more, and me going in and doing more. One uh, chapter ahead of the kids, all of that um, uh, took place. But I, what I have to say about that experience was that I had amazing, amazing teacher partners who just scooped me up, took me under their wings, and basically taught me how to teach. Uh, they taught me how to teach by giving me materials, but more importantly, by modeling for me what to do. And so I would go into their classrooms during my conference period, and I'd watch what they do. And then, of course, you know what I did? I went into my classroom and did what they did. So I just mimicked and, and learned by mimicking uh, what they did. But that experience, and I always go back to that, I, it was so valuable. I learned so much from 
um, that experience in terms of the value of a mentor, the value of having someone work with you who's teaching you, teaching you through your experience. Um, and they really uh, reinforce and establish for me what uh, you know, I still take away with me today about how to teach techniques for teaching, how to uh, react and, and relate to kids and all of that. So that was a powerful piece. And what it took me to from there is to really start to work um, in a variety of different ways um, on my campus. And so I, I'm always the type of person who like to learn new things, do new things. And so once I felt I had a grip on teaching and I didn't have to stay up late every night to plan for the next day, I got that under my belt. Then I started to branch out to want to learn new things um, that happened on the campus. And so sponsoring, uh, being a sponsor for groups and different things, and I started to learn. And what happened then was I caught, I was, um, uh, folks, administrators on the campus, I caught their eye and they started to tap me to say, you know, we'd like you to do this, we want you to do this. And me, I would just volunteer for different things. I said, oh sure, I'll serve on this, I'll serve on that, I love that. Um, and I gained a lot of experience and knowledge by doing that, by watching others, interacting with others, building a network of people, because I not only worked with my school, but they'd send me out to meetings with people from other schools. So I started to branch out and that really helped me, uh, I believe, to be known more, um, not just on my own site, but in a, on a broader, uh, uh, in a broader way in the district. And so then when it came time for me to begin to, to launch and to go into administration, folks were asking me, you need to get your credential, you need to get your administrative and master's, and you want to be an administrator, you should do that. And so I see myself, have, have I was being kind of pushed along the way, uh, pushed kind of up the ladder, if you will, come try this position, you need to do this, and people are pointing for me to do it, and I did that. And then what happened was I, had, I, had, I started to have kids. And as women, I think we know what happens for us and what can be a challenge is how do you balance your career path and your journey and your work with family and, and children? Um, because as the mom, you're mommy and you have your kids and, and that's a huge responsibility. So then I was confronted and faced with how do I keep moving forward and doing what I'm doing but also attent being attentive to, uh, to my children. And what I had to do and what I, the decision I made was then I paused for a minute and then I worked and did raising my kids for a bit. So it kind of slowed down and I stayed at a, at a place in my career where I was what I want to call a teacher leader, um, a coordinator, and I did that work for a while until my kids got a little older. They were in elementary school. And then I took, I took it up again, and, and then I was propelled into higher levels of, of administration, and I took on some jobs. But then when my kids got older into the secondary, um, I call it the later junior high school age, and those of you who have kids at that age, you know you've got to be on them and you've got to be attentive. I again paused. I was offered uh, several principalships and um, I turned them down and I was told that was the worst mistake I could ever make. You'll never get called again. If you turn down a principalship, you have to take it. Um, if you don't take it, they're never gonna call you again. And so, um, of course, I was afraid, I was concerned, but I had to make a decision at that point uh, which worked for me and worked for my family. And so I felt if I worked hard enough and I was you know, good enough that they would need me again. Um, and so I did that, and, and lo and behold, later down the line, um, a door did open, and I was able uh, to uh, become a principal um, of a high school and then go on uh, to district level administration. And for me, what uh, has been important is being present, um, making sure that I network, uh, making, availing myself to opportunities when they've been presented to me, um, and then most importantly, being a learner. Um, I have always been a learner, a lifelong learner. I always want to learn and gain information. And all of that, I say, I've put in my toolkit. And so whenever I am confronted or whenever I am exposed or um, offered a position, I bring this toolkit along with me. And when I take on, people might ask, well, why don't you try this? And you might think to yourself, well, why would I want to do that? You never know down the line when that experience will serve you.
You never know. So it's important to take advantage of what is presented to you because you may find yourself in a position where that becomes important. And that happened to me. Um, then uh, Governor Romer, who was superintendent, asked me to be assistant superintendent of student health and human services. I knew nothing about health, student health, and human services. I didn't even know what was that job entailed. And he said, it doesn't matter. You know how to lead. You can do it. You'll learn it. And so sure enough, got into the position. And um, things that I had done along the way that I never knew would be important and valuable came into play as I took on that leadership role uh, and worked in that position. And so my advice would be to those of you who are thinking about that and sometimes asking yourself, well, why would I want to do this uh, or not? Every experience I think that you can have as, uh, in terms of your professional growth is important and valuable. You learn good things from models that you see, and then you also learn important information from models that you don't want to emulate and don't want to follow. All of it's good, all of it's important for the, uh, the toolkit, and all of those experiences have helped me to um, take on what I call this uh, Goliath of a job that I have right now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And now, Karen, um, did you ever have any forks in your road? Uh, well, it's really interesting to see the, the commonalities that I hear uh, for all three of us. So let me start by saying I'm a first-generation college uh, graduate. And so besides the fact that that has obviously changed my life in ways that I can only guess, uh, I didn't do any planning. I knew I was going to go to college. And, the, and I knew I was going to be a political science major and because I wanted to go to law school. So that, you know, was my goal. And um, I went to college and became a, and I majored in political science, but along the way I met Pat Gallagher. And um, you know, he was, I, I met him when I was a freshman and uh, we got married, uh, um, I, I went through college in three years so that we could get married because he had already moved, graduated and moved away. So um, I tried, like Rivetta, I tried something else. I went in, because he was going to school. So we, one of us had to work. Um, and I tried several things, and several people said to me, you ought to be a teacher. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to be a teacher. No, uh, I, I'm going to go to law school. But I did um, um, decide that that is something I'm going to do. I, I really did not find the, the retail jobs that I was working in really that fulfilling and I, I felt that teaching would do that and I went back and did a post back uh, at, this is in the state of Washington and so I was in K-12 education for about 10 years uh, during that time I was in five school districts in three states so um, I don't have the you know the the longevity and of those uh, five uh, jobs, only one of them was uh, my decision to uh, go for a, uh, a position, a career change. My first teaching job, I was riffed. At the end of the year, I was in a district that lost 40% of its state funding, and all first year teachers uh, were, were riffed. So um, that made a deep impression on me and about what I, I was judged a, a really effective first year teacher, and yet, I had to go because there was no money. Uh, I, we, but the, my other positions, uh, we moved to North Carolina so my husband could go to graduate school and we moved to Indiana so he could, uh, that's where his first academic position was. So um, I will say those 10 years I learned a lot about how much we, schools are alike wherever you are, the structure, the, the traditions. Um, that was very informative to me uh, in thinking about what education. I also was a teacher, uh, a building administrator, and a district administrator. And in fact, I went back to get my PhD in, at Purdue University because I wanted to be a superintendent. And uh, I too have had mentors, and my mentor at Purdue said to me, yeah, you have two strikes against you in your goal. One, you're not from Indiana. And this was in the uh, mid-80s, and uh, said so it's really hard for non-Hoosiers to get top-level positions. 
So think of that, but she said, you have actually another problem, and that's you're a woman. And there are very few women superintendents in Indiana. So her suggestion to me was, think about higher ed. Uh, you can teach, you can do research, and you know, think about that. So, um, so that is what I planned for. And then my husband moved to do a postdoc in Chicago. So once again, um, I you know, was looking for a job. I also had a child. So um, I found that being in higher ed, uh, I got a job in Chicago, which is where my husband moved. And I found that, like you, Michelle, I, I was going to make some decisions about what I needed to do, both being a mother and uh, uh, my career in higher ed. So for the last 30 years, I have been in higher ed. Now, like my experience in K-12, I have been in four states, four institutions, two public and two private. And again, I see a lot of similarities because they're universities. But I also see how important context is. And, and in terms of at the university level, I, we made purposeful decisions about moving. So my husband was doing a postdoc in Chicago, and I got my first academic position there at Loyola University. Uh, and we both decided that we wanted our son to go to public schools, and it wasn't going to be in Chicago. So we looked for jobs uh, together, which is an interesting, uh, that was before people thought about um, you know, uh, hiring a husband and wife. But we were fortunate to get a job at the University of Cincinnati. And um, I quickly became, um, I'm like you, Michelle, I think, hey, I volunteer. I, I like to learn things. Um, and I did a lot of, I could do this. And, um, and so I became a, um, I went, through, I became a chair. I, I was on several leadership committees and I became an associate dean there. And at, uh, I too had another mentor who said to me, you need to think about becoming a dean. Um, and nominated me for a position at the University of Kansas. Uh, and so mo my husband and I decided when we first got married, we will move for whoever has the best opportunity. And for most of the early moves, it was things he was doing. Uh, now we're both full professors. We're, you know, I'm an associate dean. Um, and, you know, it was a family decision. Plus, our son was in elementary school. So we had to make a decision whether or not that was a, a good thing, just because it was good for me. My husband had to give up tenure. He had to move to another place. So we took a look at it, and, and collectively we thought it was a good move, that there were many things there for all of us. Uh, and so we moved to the University of Kansas. Um, and um, you know, I was, I'm very fortunate. My husband has done a lot of the co-parenting and there were many times when I became um, dean that I, I was not available for all the things my son did. Now, you know, I, for, I made me very guilty, feel guilty. Uh, he helped as a teenager to make me feel guilty about it. Oh, well, mom doesn't show up again. You know. But um, my husband did a lot. Um, and, um, you know, so I couldn't do that without, first of all, be, go on this career path without, first of all, it being a family decision, that it was good for all of us. But really, I have a remarkable husband who is willing, not once but twice, to give up his career uh, because this, then in 2000, I had the opportunity to come out to USC to become dean. Uh, by this time, our son had graduated, and in fact, he went off to college when, and we moved out here. And um, I think that what I found in my own career path is that I've had experiences in both K-12 and in higher ed that, that help inform me as I'm in a new situation or in a new place, but I never make the, I try not to make the mistake of assuming because something worked or something, an answer was what it was in Kansas or in North Carolina and it worked here, it doesn't. So even though institutions are very similar, context is really important. Um, and I, you know, I've had mentors, I've had a supportive family, and I've had, um, you know, I've been at great institutions. I look for things in both K-12 and higher ed that are, um, I think, the mission. I'm very, very com um, compelled to work in places that the mission is something I believe in. And, um, 
so I, you know, I, I see, I, I moved around. And you give up a lot by moving to different, you know, we've lived in eight states, 15 or 16 houses. Uh, I, I've met lots of people who've all in some way made me what I am. Um, and here we are uh, again with similar experiences. The first gen also has uh, uh, been a, a, an important, um, it was important to me and I try to give back in terms of helping first generation students. Wow. Wasn't that better than my reading their bios to you? <laughs> Okay, we're going to take up some topics. Um, Ravita, women continue to be underrepresented on corporate boards. In 2014, women held only 16.9% of Fortune 500 board seats and only 14.6% of executive officer positions. Women of color continue to face significant disparities. They hold just 3.2% of all Fortune 500 board seats. There was a time where they held none, 3.2. Women of color occupy only 11.9% of managerial and professional positions. It's not just, not CEO. So as a, wo a woman who reached the top, could you share your perspective on the challenges that face women seeking to advance their careers in the corporate world especially the challenges that face women of color? The privilege of taking over this very small school. And I decided if I was going to do it and I wasn't going to go to law school, I was going to do the best job I could. And so I met with the board members and I said, what's the mission of the school that you want to see fulfilled? And they told me they wanted to grow the enrollment, they wanted to diversify the faculty, they wanted a few more students of color to come into the school, et cetera. And then they made the mistake of saying, what are your goals? And I told the trustees, and there were 18 men and four women on the board, that my goal was going to be to make it the best independent school in the country. And that the impediment of being a woman and a person of color was not going to stop me and that I couldn't do it without their support, but if they would give me permission to really go for that, I would try. And so I had a very smart trustee who came to me and he said, you're not going to be content to stay in the school after you've accomplished some of your objectives. When I took over the school, there were 26 faculty and 165 children, ages two through sixth grade. When I retired this year, there were 540 children and a faculty of 104 faculty and staff. And the student body, which when I took over had three students of color, is now 51% students of color. But along the way, I set goals for myself. And what this trustee said to me is, you need to find leadership opportunities in areas other than education. You need to reach out and you need to serve on boards, on committees, on task forces, across various spectrums, so that you gain the kind of experience that will make you a better and better CEO. The annual budget of the school is $17 million. And so I knew that I was running a small nonprofit corporation. I was a corporate CEO. And so there came invitations to sit on boards, other school boards, nonprofit boards like the Fulfillment Fund, which mentors inner city students in public schools and then helps them on a college pathway. I served on several independent school boards. And you never know, and one of the most important things, I was given advice in, early in my career was you never know when someone you meet is going to reemerge in your life with an opportunity that's going to be extraordinarily important for them and for you. And sure enough, I'd been a school head for about 15 years, and I got a call, and it was from the Walt Disney Company. And it was from Frank Wells, who was the president. 
And he said, I've heard about you from Michael Eisner, who was a parent in your school for many years. And he said, I'd like to talk to you. Will you come have lunch with me? And I said, sure. So I drove to Burbank to the studio and met with Frank Wells. And at the end of the lunch, he said, we would like you to become one of the board of governors of the Walt Disney Company. And I said, really? And he said, yes. And I said, OK. Just as I said, OK, to being a head of school, I figured, you know what? I've been able to build a tool chest of skills that I used to run a nonprofit corporation, to grow and diversify a school and a faculty, and to gain reputation for that school. I bet I can be a good corporate governor. And so I went on to the Walt Disney Company board. Now, what he hadn't told me was that I would be the only voting woman on the board. Corporate boards are very small. And so there were 15 people on the board. I was the only woman. I was the first woman of color on the corporate board. And I was the only voting woman. There had been another woman on the board, Carolyn Amundsen who was a trustee emeritus at that point. And so I went onto the board and they said, what committees would you like to be on? And I'd always loved understanding how organizations function. And so I took a leap of faith and I said, I wanna be on the audit committee. And then I wanna be on the executive compensation committee because I wanna understand why people in entertainment are paid so much money. <laughs> And so I began by serving on the Executive Compensation Committee and the Audit Committee, and I served on that board for 10 years. It's interesting how hard it is to be a woman on a board, and particularly on a corporate board. I was challenged once. Corporate board members stand for re-election every year. And I was challenged once in my entire tenure on the board and it was by the head of my retirement annuity who felt that it was inappropriate for a teacher and an administrator to be on a corporate board, that you needed to be running a for-profit corporation. So Tia Kreff, where I paid my retirement and paid into my retirement for 44 years, was the only challenge to my leadership as a corporate governor on a corporate board. And I found that ironic, that a retirement annuity that serves so many women and so many teachers would challenge the only teacher. And at that time, I was one of the few black women on any corporate board anywhere in the world. And I was one of only 17 women of color on corporate boards but they decided to challenge my re-election to the board. Didn't do them any good. <laughs> um, but one of the things I've understood over time is that we need mentors. And that on your way up the corporate ladder or up the administrative ladder or up the education ladder or up the ladder in your individual school or business, don't go out of your way to make enemies. It's much easier to make friends or to at least be cordial with the relationships that you develop because you never know when one of those relationships will bear fruit. And that's not to say that you're going to not meet some people who aren't your friends on your way up the trajectory. But one of the things that I've been able to do that I would advise all of you to do is don't go out of your way to make enemies of people. It's just as easy to walk away and say, I'm going to be cordial, I'm going to be gracious, I'm going to take the high road, and I'm going to take the road that will help me fulfill my ambitions, and I'm not going to worry about the ambitions of someone else to derail my train. So I had a wonderful career. I was the first, I was the only independent school head of color for 14 years in California. Now California is one of the most diverse states with 
people of color leading independent schools among the 240 independent schools in California. Wow. Superintendent King. You know, we hear about the glass ceiling, and I've heard many women say, you broke through, and they want to follow behind you. Only 23% uh, of superintendents, approximately, are women, but 76% of teachers are women. What's happening? And what advice do you have for uh, women administrators or teachers in the room who aspire to follow you? through that opening that you've created? You know, I thought about um, that question in my experience um, uh, as a teacher, and then I thought back through the years, and, and, and I realized that I think I only had one female principal at the time through when I was a teacher, and all of my other uh, administrators' principals were male. And, and that spoke to me because you think about who then moves on from, um, in the way education works, if you're a principal, then you might move on to the next level. And so just by myself alone, I had not experienced having females um, in the principalship, particularly at the secondary or the high school level. And then when I became a high school principal, I remember going to my first meeting um, of high school principals in LA at the time, there were about 50 high schools, uh, so 50 high school principals. And I would dare say maybe there were three of us that were female uh, principals of a high school. It was uh, believed to be a job that a male would, would have uh, being uh, over a high school. So I thought about that in relationship to um, the superintendency. And I think that, you know, in L.A., first of all, I am the third woman to hold uh, this role. The last female was in 1929, Susan Miller Dorsey. So the last time there was a female leading L.A., 1929, that that occurred. And what it said to me was, you know, folks, what you see, they see before them men in and, and leadership roles, and so then that is often replicated. And when something doesn't happen, then it's uh, seen as out of the ordinary and usual, and it's difficult for folks to invest in and believe in what they might consider the unknown. What will that be like uh, to have a, a female in charge? What, what will happen? Um, and then I think part of it also has to, to do with how women sometimes are perceived um, as leaders in leadership roles um, and uh, just us in, our, in terms of our behavior and our actions. And so when it comes to um, thinking of a, a female as tough or being able to be decisive or make the hard call or being able to manage a, a multi-billion dollar budget, um, it's often not thought that a, a woman could do that role. You need a man to be in that role. And so what I see that has to happen and what we see happening more are women being in roles so that uh, we can be observed in these leadership positions so then more can say, well, oh, we see that a, a woman is leading in LA or a woman is leading in Washington, DC, and they're able to lead these organizations. And then a board will be more likely to give the opportunity to another uh, female, another woman to be able to follow behind. And so it's important, I talked before about presence and being uh, engaged and being in different places. And that's so important because what people see when it's demonstrated before them, then they're more likely to be, uh, feel better about uh, doing that, or be better about uh, lending that opportunity to make it happen. And so it might not be yet at the superintendent uh, level, but it could be at other levels where they are seeing uh, 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 ladies or women uh, uh, head budgets and able to bring a budget home and able to manage that or manage a division. And when they see that occurring, then it opens the door and makes it easier for others to believe that women can do the role. I often talk about uh, those of us who are in positions, it's are important for us to be the ones to have the voice for others so that others can follow. And to be those uh, role models, to be those that speak out uh, on behalf, in this case women, and for me women of color, to say that this can happen and this is how it can happen. And then to encourage women to go for it. That's the other piece I talk about because there's so few, um, women are sometimes reluctant to take it on, 
reluctant to want to step into the role because there's so few there. And so we have to encourage uh, women to be resilient, to be courageous and bold, to want to go and step up. And when it doesn't happen the first, the second, or the third time, you can't give up. That's the other piece. The one, the one you go for the first, second, and third time might not be the fit. You, it might not be the one for you, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one for you. Doesn't mean that it won't be there and it doesn't exist. And so to be persistent and to keep after it and to keep trying is really important to do that because then you are able to ultimately find the one that is the right one because you don't want the wrong one. Be, be sure, you don't want the wrong one. You want the one that is a best, the best fit uh, for you. So my advice would be to seek it out if that's something that you want to do and to not be afraid to go for it because you would be the first or the only one. Uh, you know, and, and a woman of color, I think of many rooms, either it's board rooms or conference meetings or classrooms even in college where I was the only female um, and African American in the room and what that means. So I understand how isolating that could be and how challenging it could be at times. But you can reach out across the way, not just where you are, but others to be able to build networks. I always say what men I think do really well, and we call it you know, that, that old boys kind of group club that meets, that comes together. Men do that really well. Women don't do that as well uh, to come together and those kind of networks where we help cultivate together and then move and help get others in position and then support one another once we're there, which is another key piece supporting each other in different roles coming together is valuable so you have someone that you can talk to and it doesn't have to necessarily be in your field it's just in leadership roles where you're in charge where you can go and have those uh, conversations in a safe place with critical friends who can give you some advice who are not yes people who can tell you the truth and then you can go back uh, and do your role so um, the I feel that it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to be those who are willing to break through because you have to be willing to take it on and just because it's not it hasn't happened before doesn't mean that it can't happen um, and so I encourage all of us to, uh, to do that let's move back to higher education um, Karen uh, from 1986 to 2011 the number of women college and university presidents jumped from 10 to 26 percent from your perspective as one of the leading school of education deans in the nation, what's changing? What still needs to change? What's your advice there? Well, there are, I mean, at the same time, there were uh, uh, not, in, in the late 80s, there weren't that many women deans of anything, uh, education or even other related fields where women were the dominant, uh, uh, you know, nursing and teaching. Um, I think that part of it was as um, baby boomers began getting experience and began, um, you know, move in, in both K-12 and in higher ed as they began uh, seeing careers being encouraged. I had mentors too. I will say mentors are really important, have been very important to me, not only to encourage me to try something, but also to listen. To, to let me talk about what's going on, to uh, let me observe. I mean, I, I think that's important. And as more women um, began to see themselves in leadership positions and going, being encouraged to try to become a dean um, or to become a, a superintendent or become a president, uh, you, you do need uh, people to sometimes say to you, yeah, you, you can do this. I mean, this is um, the, um, I've been fortunate, I've had both female mentors and male mentors. I've had uh, three of the really important mentors to me were African American. Um, I, you know, they, they, they listened and watched what I was doing and encouraged me, but also not to just do anything. I mean, I will tell you, I, have, I can't tell you the number of interviews I've been on. I'm not afraid to go for interviews if I think there's something I can contribute. Um, and not getting it is not the worst thing that ever happened to you. I have missed, I mean, I actually think I've dodged some bullets by not getting uh, some of the positions that I really thought I wanted. 
Um, I've also made, um, I, I will say one of the, um, so I think that women have begun to do that and more and be, in, be encouraged to, you know, it's okay to fail. Um, I, um, it, when I was in K-12, I felt it was really important for uh, what I thought Title IX did was to encourage, to give opportunities to girls to be in all kinds of sports, particularly team sports. So I think the reason that men have had a leg up on this notion of networks and working together is because they many have had this kind of a, a opportunity to play sports, to understand that it's a team that is successful. And so even though I didn't participate in sports, I'm really kind of klutzy. I, I coached whatever they needed a coach in middle school or in high school. I, you know, I did it. I, I thought girls ought to have that opportunity to do it. And I think as we've seen young women get more opportunities like that, they've seen themselves in all sorts of roles. It isn't, you know, it's, uh, it's not, even though still you can be the first woman to do something. I was the first woman dean of education at USC. I was the first uh, dean of education, a woman dean of education at the University of Kansas. We're not, you know, that's hard to believe, but there are still, um, I still think it, we've, we've begun to see women more because we've had other kinds of opportunities that prepare us to think about being a leader. I'm Ayana Davis and I'm a second year student with the LCL program. And um, I'm an 18-year principal with Los Angeles Unified School District at two early ed centers. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, Ms. Bowers, is how did you uphold the integrity and the value of early education over those 44 years when just not until recently, studies have revealed that early ed makes a difference in the child's outcome academically through the K through 12 world? I find it a challenge that people think that as a school leader of early ed centers, we're just babysitting and it's a child care. So what did you do? You know, part of the mission of the school was to give two-year-olds through 12-year-olds the best possible education we could in an increasingly diverse setting. And so as parents began to recognize what the school program was giving their children, the word spread, and other parents began to recognize it. And when parents weren't tooting our horn, we tooted our own horn. And we started producing a school magazine, a school newsletter, a weekly bulletin to tell parents what was going on. Today, social media is the friend of good educators because you can get the word out quickly about what you're doing. You can have a website that is informative, that invites parents to be your partners. And we made partnerships and pacts with parents that said, if you support the educational mission of our organization, we're gonna give your children the best possible preparation, not just for school, but for life they can possibly have. And parents who saw that education benefiting their children as they moved through the school and then went on to be successful in middle schools and then in college, the reputation of the school grew and the reputation of the mission grew. So I think to be very clear about what your mission is and to be explicit, the second thing I will tell you is that parent education was as important to me as the education of the students that we taught and nurtured. And so parents don't know how to appreciate an education unless we teach them to be good partners and good educational partners in the education of those young children. And so it was important to me that the parents grew in their learning as parents just as the children grew in their learning as students. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Trina Moore Southall. I'm also an administrator in an independent school um, for about 20 years. And my question is in the membership of boards mm -hmm. for, you explained how Disney kind of sought you out and came after you. Were there any boards that you pursued membership with? And if so, how did that happen? First, I went to organizations and volunteered. I went to educational organizations like the Fulfillment Fund. I went to hospitals. 
I went to early childhood learning centers as volunteers. I went and taught child development classes to unwed pregnant teens uh, as part of my volunteer commitment. So I started as a volunteer. And then the quality of volunteerism is often noted. You know, you start as a volunteer within your own institution, you go out into other institutions, and then the invitations came. I had been invited on to 20 some boards before I was asked to be on the Disney board. And that was through networking within the public school sector, within the public education sector, within the independent school sector. I volunteered for projects for the California Association of Independent School. I taught workshops. I did seminars. I went and worked as a mentor to mentor young teachers. People notice when you're doing good work, and especially when you're not asking for anything in return, mm -hmm. except to be able to do the good work. And then the board invitations started to come. Um, so they've come from universities, they've come from corporations, they've come from national organizations, from local organizations. And the advantage of being a woman of color is there still aren't that many of us out there. Um, and my mother gave me three really good pieces of advice because she was appalled that I was going to work for an independent school. She wanted me to follow in her footsteps with LA Unified. She said, always dress for the job you want, not the job you have. She said, so don't ever underdress for the job you have. She said, number two, remember that somebody is always watching you. Friends, your next potential boss, your worst enemy. Always make sure that you conduct yourself in a way that when you go home at the end of the day, you can be proud of. And the third thing she said to me, which was a really wonderful piece of advice, she said, everywhere you are, develop a mirror friend. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, it's somebody who will hold a mirror up when you're not looking honestly at yourself and they'll tell you what they see in you, which helps you become more self-reflective and able to grow in a way that you wouldn't grow otherwise. So I would say first start out by being a volunteer in your own school, then volunteer in other schools, and the board opportunities will come faster than you can possibly consider them. Hi, my name is Denise Marcelo. I'm teaching in Anaheim Elementary School District. Uh, my question is for Superintendent King. I'm just dying to know. Um, you moved up through LAUSD. What challenges, if any, did you have from having colleagues, you're a teacher, and now all of a sudden those colleagues, you're their boss? Mm -hmm. How did you deal with any of what challenges? <laughs> Thank you. You know, actually, I would say the most challenging in my experience was when I moved from assistant principal at a school to being principal of that same school. I would say that was the most challenging because I worked with my colleague assistant principals. We were all together doing the same thing. And then all of a sudden, now I was their boss. Um, and that, that was a challenge. So with teachers as being the superintendent, actually that is it's an, uh, a benefit. And from what I've heard from teachers as I've had the opportunity to go across the district is uh, that they are pleased that they have a, an educator um, in the role of superintendent, someone who did serve uh, as a teacher and has walked that walk that we talk about and uh, they feel that that is valuable, uh, that, that we can talk about what it means to uh, have effective teaching and learning um, uh, in the classroom for kids, and they see that uh, as an asset in the role. So that has not been as challenging as actually when I've worked with people closely as, as colleagues and peers, and then move to then be their supervisor, uh, that has been uh, a more challenging role. But many of you might find yourselves in, in that situation, and it's important, I think, when you do find that happening, you have to establish what the clear, the clear boundaries are. Because once you move to boss or supervisor versus colleague and peer, it is a definite difference. Um, and so you have to make sure that you, you first are aware of that, 
you make that clear to, to them, and then it's about uh, business. And everyone uh, knew that because people are, like we said, are always watching you. So if you seem to be you know, somehow favoring one person over the other, it's gonna be a problem. And so you have to make sure that there's equity and that you're fair and that you're objective uh, with everyone that you are engaged with. When I was at the University of Cincinnati, I was a faculty member, and then I became an associate dean. And um, I had all these friends that I had, you know, uh, we've gone through many things together. And uh, it depended on what they thought of administrators uh, in terms of how they reacted to me. But mainly, they looked to make sure that I was not different. I was not valuing different things, that I still had the same uh, values. Uh, guiding me as an, as an associate dean that I had had as a faculty member. So that, in a way, goes to what Renita was, Ravita was saying about, uh, you know, uh, people are always watching you, and they are judging you, and sometimes they'll confront you with it, sometimes they won't. But if you are one thing in one role in a, and you act a different way, people will notice that. So it still doesn't mean people might, I mean, I had friends who, didn't like the things that we had to do, uh, and uh, said, you know, questioned why I was doing it, uh, although, because they didn't agree. But not that I hadn't, you know, it was unusual for me to take a stance that I hadn't had as a faculty member. So I think it happens in all organizations. <clears throat> I left school as a pregnant teacher in June and came back as the head of the school in September. So, <laughs> hello, I had more than a baby. Yeah. Um, so, one of the things I realized was, I was gonna deal with some resentment, mm -hmm. and I knew that. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't straddle the fence between being a member of the faculty and being an administrator. I couldn't have a foot in both parks. Mm -hmm. So, I stepped over the fence, but I made sure that I worked harder than anybody who reported to me. Mm -hmm. I was there when they got there in the morning, and I was there when they left at night. And I made sure that I worked and modeled the work ethic that I expected everybody else to mirror. So that when there was a meeting, I was in the room with the janitor setting up chairs. And when the meeting was over, I was taking down the chairs and washing the punch bowl. I was there in the morning when the first teacher arrived, and most times, unless I had a meeting off campus, I was there when they left, which meant that I was at work from 6.15 in the morning till 6 o'clock at night if I didn't have a night meeting. But modeling that work ethic and being willing to do anything, one of the things I learned watching Michael Eisner run the Disney Corporation was as we toured parks all over the world, if he saw a piece of paper on the ground, he bent over and picked it up. And I think one of the mistakes we made when we ascend to leadership is believing that some jobs are beneath us. And if you believe that, you won't be a successful leader. So when a child threw up in front of me, I didn't ring for the janitor, I started cleaning it up. And that earned me the respect of my peers but it also earned me the respect of the janitorial crew and the clerks and the school nurse and the parents because there was no job that was beneath me. And I think if you lead in an authentic way and let people know that you're willing to do the work that they do as well as your own work, you'll have a much easier time. Um, my name is Larise Towns, and I'm a 20-year veteran teacher with Corona Noco. I started in LA Unified. My mom taught here for 20 years. Then I was in Reno Valley for um, one year, and I've been with Corona for 15. And I've been, you guys said don't straddle the fence, but I've been kind of straddling the fence on moving into the administrative position. I keep having people tell me every time they come and watch me teach, you need to be in administration. You need to go that route. You need to go that route but I'm so passionate about teaching, I just haven't left the classroom yet. So what was in the three of you that said, it's time to you know, just take a leap of faith and do something different? I realized in stepping into the head's role that I would be teaching full time. 
my students would be different. I would be modeling for the students in school, going into the classroom, helping a teacher teach a lesson. But more importantly, I'd be teaching parents and I'd be teaching teachers. And so I didn't feel that leaving the classroom, even though I did it for the money, <laughs> was going to cut short my teaching career. It was just going to expand it. And I found at every step of the way opportunities to keep teaching. Um, for the last 15 years, I've run the National Independent School Heads program so that I've taught over 700 new heads of school from around the country. So teaching is a part of me now. And I always took the opportunity, even when I was doing an observation of a teacher in the classroom, if I saw a child struggling with a concept, I'd walk over and sit with that child and help him or her to understand what the teacher was trying to teach. And that was critically important. So it was just taking a step in a different direction, not walking away from teaching. And I would say the same thing, um, that your, your classroom is just bigger. It's, it's adults as well as kids. Uh, it's, uh, it's people who are interested in the profession. It's your colleagues in professional organizations. That it is still uh, teaching and that you're, there are things you're trying to get people to know and understand. And that that's, you know, the, that uh, the skills of being a great teacher are very helpful for working to get uh, changes made in organizations. So for me, uh, I was challenged by what you've just described. I didn't want to leave the classroom either. So mine was more gradual. I did a part-time uh, assignment. So I taught for three periods, and then I had an opportunity to do administrative work for three periods. So it was more gradual. So I had my foot still, and I was teaching. And then I worked in the office, and I, had, uh, I was given some administrative duties and assignments. So for me, that that was a way to, uh, uh, to transition from one uh, to the other. And for me, I wanted to see if I liked it, how would it be, is this something I really wanted to do? And at the time, the administration, they wanted me to come out full time. I didn't want to go out, so this was something they devised so that they, can, uh, they would get me the, uh, give me the opportunity to do it. And that was very helpful because then I got a chance to kind of do both. And actually, it really informed my work in the classroom, I have to tell you, really having experiences in, in both worlds. And then from there, I made the decision then to, to participate fully in an out of the classroom position. And finally, I just have to say, when I left the school site, it's really about the school site, to what I want to call central administration, that was the harder part. It was really leaving kids for me because I was so engaged with kids. And even now as superintendent, I have a day on my calendar that's at the school, school site visits. I mean, that's just how important it is to me. So I have them block that on my calendar because I wanted to still stay connected. So there's a way for you to still remain connected even though you go into administration, particularly if you're thinking about outside of the school site. A former assistant superintendent said that she no longer could do the job because she went into that position with the teacher hat on versus having the policy and the leadership hat on. Do you agree with that? I always have my teacher hat on. I, I consider myself a teacher. Uh, I am a teacher. Okay. And that's how I, I lead uh, as a teacher. As was just described, it's just a larger classroom. I have students who, and I have uh, adults, but I am still a teacher. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I actually have time for one quick question that I think um, probably most of the women in the room want to ask. You're all mothers, and what I find um, that women sometimes are nervous about asking, but it's that balance question. Is there such a thing as balance when you're working to the top? No. And no. There's no such there's thing no as balance, balance in life, quite No, frankly. there's no balance. <laughs> you become skilled at managing the imbalance. And I think that's what you have to do. It sounds like we all had wonderful partners. I was married to a wonderful man who was willing to pick up the slack. Um, he's a superior court judge in a criminal court. Uh, but he was able to see when I needed help and step in and do that. 
He was never going to make the canopies for a cocktail party. But he could go pick up the kids from school, and he could take them to a piano lesson, and he could see that they got the dinners that I cooked all weekend that could be microwave. Thank God for a microwave. <laughs> um, we just have to understand that very few of us have real balance in our lives. Whether we're administrators or in charge of a business or we're full-time students, because life is about seeking balance. Nobody ever promised us we'd find it. I also don't think it's something that just women have to, to learn. I think balance is about, um, you're, you're, trying, you're making uh, goals, you're setting priorities for yourself. And, uh, <laughs> As you, I think you've heard all of us say, when our kids were younger, we had different priorities than as they got older. I mean, and I don't think uh, fathers, that's different. Uh, uh, I too had a, you know, my, my, I still have him, he's a terrific spouse, and he did step in, uh, but he was in education. So uh, in many ways that, you know, we were doing the same thing. He just did not want, he, he liked being a professor not going into administration, and you know we've been able to, to uh, share responsibilities, or sometimes it's just, I'm sorry, I gotta do this, and you know, <laughs> you're gonna have to carry on. So for me, I think it's about uh, support systems. Mm -hmm. It's all about the kinds of support systems, and we all have uh, different support systems uh, in place to help us uh, get it done. And so we, when you think about a team, you think about different parts of the team help you get a, a job done, and that's how I see it in my life. I had uh, different folks on my team, if you will, that helped me um, and, and be able to do the different things that needed to be done uh, for kids. And the kids are so resilient, um, and it's amazing how they can bend and, and move uh, once they understand how things will work. And so if mom can't pick up, then maybe dad can't pick up, or grandma can pick up, or maybe uh, I had carpool partners. Mm -hmm. And so friends were part of the team, and we carpooled. I would drop off and you pick up. And so you work out these different systems so that you're able uh, to get it done and, and make it work. And then I, I always remember when I was a principal, the great thing was I could schedule back to school night. So that meant I could plan it around when my kids had their activity. So it was fabulous. So it does have benefits. You do get an opportunity to control some things so it can make it work for you. So as a final question, um, and just briefly, but as you look back on your own careers with all the wisdom that you have acquired, what advice would you give yourself if you were starting out? Think of yourself that first day in school, or think of yourself in high school when you were thinking about your future. If you could whisper in your ear that younger version of yourself, what would you say? First and foremost, be true to self. Be true to who you are, know who you are, uh, what your desires are, what you want to see happen, um, and stay true to that. In other words, don't um, acquiesce and try to change who you are and your essence um, for someone else or something um, else. I think that's critical and important. And then I have to say to go for it. Um, to go for your dreams, to set it, and to go for it. And don't let uh, naysayers or those who, and there will be those who will tell you you can't or you shouldn't. It's not time. What do you think you're doing? It's not for you. And you can't allow those, those voices um, to get in your way and to hinder you from going for your dreams. So true to self and go for your dreams. Thank you. Karen. Well, I, similar to um, Michelle, I do think I would say to myself, uh, I actually have few regrets about the big decisions, about moving, about uh, um, uh, you know, the choices of moving around. Uh, I know what one gives up. So I think that uh, don't be afraid. You, it's not that you can have it all, but you don't have to do just one thing. You don't, you, being a leader, being a teacher, be, whatever it is you want, it doesn't mean you can't do anything else. You can't be a wife, you can't be a husband, you can't be a mother. Um, it m might mean that, as you've heard us say, you're going to have to get a team, but don't, uh, don't feel like you can't do what you want to do because 
uh, and only do that, that you, that, that you can't have other things to do in life. And so, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm glad I made the choices I made. I wouldn't change my life in that of the, the, the places I've lived and the people I've met. I think as I look back on my early education and then my career, if I had known how important it was to understand how businesses and systems operate, I wouldn't have kept wrapping the garbage in the business section of the paper. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've told young women that I've mentored over the years is, you will never get anywhere in your career if one of the first things out of your mouth is, I was never any good in math. So pay attention to how systems run and operate. Make numbers your friends. Because whether you're balancing a household budget or the budget of a classroom or an organization or you're on the board of an organization, the decimal point just keeps moving. So it doesn't matter if you're working with small numbers or large numbers. And the other thing I would say that, as advice, I wished I had taken more readily was never be afraid to toot your own horn. Often we're self-effacing and we say, I don't know whether I can do that. If you want it badly enough, you'll figure out how to do it. And so take the chance, take the leap of faith. Go for the job, even if you don't get it. The experience of putting together a good resume, going through an interview, and ask for feedback. Ask for honest feedback, and then learn from it. It has been inspirational and insightful to hear the journey's wisdom and advice of our distinguished panelists. Please join me in thanking them for opening that window. <laughs>